Yeah, so we are live and welcome to this uh, session on the Horasis uh, General Body Meeting with regard to artificial intelligence as a force for good. So we are here today and we have uh, speakers from world over who will be deliberating on uh, on the way artificial intelligence is impacting our lives. As we all know, whether it's from uh, language translations to, uh, to conversational AI, to driverless cars, to use of AI in healthcare or agriculture, AI has been impacting our lives in almost every way. And all of us have been using AI in some form or the other. And AI, AI as is evolving, is impacting services in every dimension of life that we see in. So we today we have an excellent panel of speakers from the world over. We have uh, Jay Darwala, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Yaktrak Online from Canada. We have Kovi Kurihara, who is the co-founder of Privacy by Design Lab Japan. We have Arvind Smith, who is the author of Identity Reboot from United Kingdom. We have Sebastian Vernickel, chief data scientist of One Logic Germany. And I am Abhishek Singh, the moderator for the day. Uh, I work for Government of India. I am the CEO of the National League Governance Division and the MyGov, which is a citizen engagement platform. And we do use artificial intelligence in several of our projects, whether it's uh, with regard to uh, letting people find vaccination centers or letting people discover services based on their profile uh, with the uh, use of image processing for uh, for uh, for uh, helping people get various services so ai is being used in every way possible in fact we did a ai chatbot uh, on covid which allowed people to find out where vaccination centers will be there what are the symptoms where to uh, source uh, where to get help from and that became very useful in uh, what we did we're using ai in uh, agriculture in a big way wherein farmers can uh, farmers can click pictures of their crops if they are if they are having any diseases and they can send it to a centralized number and then there are uh, diagnostics are done and they get advisories in their language on their phone we have also, in fact, uh, one more thing that was done recently was X-ray bot. Uh, one X-ray bot was made using AI. And what it did was that people, a lot of people were requiring CT scans to see how their lungs were doing after getting impacted by COVID. And instead of that, what we, uh, solution came in that instead of going for the high cost CT scans, one could do simple X-rays and the X-ray images could be uploaded in a system. And the, the tool was able to die, die, to tell which was trained with the earlier with the images that they had and to provide the right uh, suggestions and the right uh, intervention that the person can take. So I would just start this conversation by saying that AI has been around us for some time. It is impacting us in every way possible. It is there. It's going to be there with us for a long time. But how do we evolve that? How do we use AI in such a way that it's, it's, uh, it promotes it more ethical uses of AI? Because once we may are able to make machines which can think like humans, which can do th things that humans do, can they go and become smarter or more crooked than men? Can human beings can do do, do things which uh, which we would not like it to do? And how do we regulate that? How do we ensure that the AI is used more in the sense of public good? And uh, in in what ways we should promote research? We should uh, allow AI to evolve, but at the same time, uh, to at the same time drive in incentives or drive in efforts to have more ethical uses of AI. So with this in the background, I would invite the, our speakers for the day. We have uh, Koye Kurihara, who is the co-founder of Privacy by Design Lab from Japan. I would like him to make introduce himself, the work he does, and uh, give his perspective on the topic. Yeah, thank you for the introductions. Then I'm very honored to have a, a session today regarding the AI for good. Uh, my name is uh, Kohei Krihara. I'm a co-founder of the Privacy by Design Lab. Uh, we are in a base in Japan. Uh, we deploy the uh, privacy programs for the enterprises, the public institutions, uh, to, um, to, to make a practice, uh, in terms of the privacy by design to the service design in their business operations. Um, from my perspective, the AI then, uh, needs to take more considerations to, uh, deploy into the societies, uh, because the, among the privacy industries, uh, we are, uh, very, uh, serious about these technologies, uh, to bring to some impact, uh, related to the, uh, the protections, uh, since the GDPL has been started the, uh, three years ago. This is the third annual year. 
a lot of uh, incidents is uh, is been uh, uh, indicated by the uh, data protection authority in Europe. And uh, also, there's some American uh, states uh, legitimate this in uh, enforcement uh, in terms of the uh, facial recognitions or other biometrics um, selections of the people uh, determinations, which is a uh, very serious at this moment. Uh, they also we had uh, some uh, serious incidents in Japan, especially the one recruiting company is uh, collecting a personal data without a specific consent. To use it for the uh, scoring, uh, their evaluations. So this is a very big issue. So is there any specific uh, notifications for the users to use the personal data for AI or machine learning? And also the automatic judgment is a very um, big impact for the users in case uh, the, their data is not the sufficient. There are also inaccuracies. So we have to uh, reconsider again and again uh, what the personal data could be used for the AI and how the impact will bring us through the uh, new technologies. So this is my area I'm exploring these times. Thank you. Thank you. Like uh, privacy becomes a very important aspect whenever we are looking at data science, especially applications of data science for services, for uh, building AI models and especially in the context of uh, using identity for delivering services. Uh, in India, we have a project called Unique ID in which we have given more than 1 billion uh, Unique ID numbers based on biometrics, but therein always the issues of privacy uh, comes in, like how secure that whole system is and how we can do that. So with that, I would like to bring in Arvin Smith, who is the author of Identity Reboot uh, from United Kingdom to share her, to introduce herself and to share her perspective on the topic of how we can make AI more useful for everyone. Thank you very much. So my background is in technology ethics and my interest is in the advancements in technology and their intended but also their unintended consequences on society. And in exploring that field that drew me to the subtopic of identity. And what identity means for me is that it's actually the nexus of where data gets um, gathered online. So as that is the very beginning of the end of our question, artificial intelligence, that is going to be my angle today. So as we are developing these systems, what kind of data are they actually built on? Um, what kind of remit do we have for deployment? Um, is that a national remit? Is that an international remit or is it remit coming from private companies? And I think especially relevant considering the current pandemic, if we are looking to deploy artificial intelligence in a crisis, what is the status of that system pre-crisis and what is the status of that system post-crisis? So my angle today will very much be the long-term ethical angle. And I'm very much looking forward to the views of everyone here on this panel. Thank you. Okay, that's a very interesting aspect, like long-term ethical uh, issues with regard to AI-based systems, because any AI-based system which would uh, deliver any service to people would definitely rely on a lot of data and how the data is used, how the data is anonymized, how we can ensure that the the non-personal data is used for building better models and building better services. That's a challenge that all data scientists are trying to address and uh, ensuring that we being compliant with the, the the data privacy laws of the European Union and also we have none other than Sebastian Wernickel, who is the chief data scientist with one logic gem from Germany, who would be sharing his perspective on that. How do you go? How do you ensure that that uh, the ethical aspects of data and data science and AI is ensured while building better solutions? Mm. Well, thank you for the introduction. So. Um... Yes, as, as you mentioned, uh, I'm chief data scientist at OneLogic. We are a company specializing on data science and artificial intelligence, working together with many large, mainly industrial clients. And what we constantly notice is that there's a, well, it's, it's basically a, a, the flip side of the 80-20 principle. If you're trying to use artificial intelligence in an industrial or production setting, by which I mean the following. Um, 
the tools that we have at hand are extremely powerful and they allow us to very quickly set up proof of concepts where we can basically show here's something where artificial intelligence might be useful, might accelerate something, might do something good. And the trap or fallacy here is to then think, well, we're basically done. We can just run the system and just let it loose and, you know, keep on going. And this is where basically to get that final 20% of the solution in, that's actually 80% of the effort, which is to ensure that these systems run stable, that they do actually what they're supposed to do. And uh, like Aaron said, um, especially we, we avoid the unintended consequences. And uh, I think a very public example of that is, uh, for example, the amplification of hate speech online, right? Where basically the, the initial intention of the algorithm is let's just promote something that's interesting to people, which is a very good intention, of course. But then we find out that stuff we find interesting is not necessarily the good stuff. You know? So I think keeping in mind that setting up something quickly that, um, you know, looks looks promising and looks good is only the start of the work and we need to put in the the, the final 80 percent um to make to make sure that these systems run as intended for a long time a second aspect i want to quickly add i think when we consider using artificial intelligence as a force for good um, we should not just restrict the discussion to how can we prevent artificial intelligence from doing bad stuff because um of course there's also the side that Artificial intelligence can really, like uh, all, all of you already mentioned, really help us uh, go forward as a society. Um, for example, one of the fields that we are working on a lot is the field of sustainability, where in order to reach our sustainability goals, we work closely with industry using artificial intelligence to improve the production processes, to create less waste, to uh, more efficiently get goods from A to B. And I think this is also a consideration that that needs to be part of such a discussion um, because in the end while we need to avoid the bad stuff there's also a lot of opportunity to really do something good and effective yeah, yeah that, that that's very interesting uh, like how do we ensure that we use ai to, to do the good stuff and uh, that brings me to Jay Daruwala, who is the chief executive officer of Yakta Online and in Canada. And he has been using uh, a lot of the good stuff, like how do you use uh, voice mining to build solutions and to give a better customer experience. So, Jay, would you like to share about your perspective with regard to how you are using AI for the good stuff? Well, sure. I mean, I mean, I can, I can. Uh, uh, it is, it is an entrepreneur's uh, kind of perspective. Uh, I think, I suppose, everyone can hear me, right? Um, all right. And um, so there are two businesses uh, that I'm involved in where AI is used. One of them is in the area of speech uh, recognition, Abhishek, as you said. And there, you know, it's a pretty standard affair for us. I mean, of course, we do have to redact uh, the information from a privacy perspective uh, because these are call centers, people giving up, you know, credit card numbers and phones all the time and stuff like that. And probably even more sensitive information like social security numbers or whatever. Uh, and so by default, we basically kind of redact any numeric sequence that's got more than three characters in it that would protect even like the three digit CVV on the back of a credit card, for example. Uh, so that's standard out of the box. I mean, I don't think anybody would buy our product if we didn't have that, for example, uh, you know, and uh, so in that sense, customers are pretty uh, aware, you know, of their obligations. And then uh, beyond that, there are certain more advanced uh, uh, cases like GDPR, where you may also want something like first name, last name combinations, you know, to be redacted. That tends to be a little harder, uh, but we do have, you know, uh, uh, ways of, of handling that as well. So that's 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 what I've seen in terms of privacy on the speech side. There's another venture that I'm involved in that's more nascent at this point, but it really involves the application of computer vision algorithms on um, uh, satellite remote sensing data. And although we haven't fully unpacked, you know, it's a fairly new idea. We're still designing the product. And while designing the product, I was speaking with my cousin who happens to be a police officer in, in California. And uh, just just uh, just even opening up that discussion, like was my God, it was like a nightmare uh, 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 of privacy related questions, because the in one one initial crazy idea I had there was that, hey, wouldn't it be great if I could top up your local security product by saying for 10 bucks a month, 
uh, you can have this satellite uh, uh, imaging of your home. And in case you're out and somebody broke into your home, you could maybe track that that uh, that car that was parked outside and which was used uh, or whatever and the moment we started unpacking that you know because he's a police officer he was very, we very quickly went down a rabbit hole uh, that that sounded you know pretty interesting and and pretty uh, uh, questionable uh, from the you know privacy question not just uh, from the perspective of the person who would have broken into the home but also from the perspective of the person who owned the home and what does all this mean, uh, you know, from the point of view of uh, the privacy of all of this uh, information? So it was a pretty interesting one. Actually, it, 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 it turned out to be such a complex rabbit hole that we decided to abandon that thing altogether, saying that this just sounds too complicated at the moment. You know, let's focus on some simpler, uh, you know, applications instead of that. So these are some of the experiences that I've had in connection with the privacy of, uh, you know, various kinds of AI systems. Interesting. So, uh, so after these initial conversations, in fact, the thoughts that come to uh, one's mind is that when we look at AI as a force for good, is uh, is privacy an uh, enabler or does it inhibit uh, uh, one's ability to innovate and build better solutions? Can there be like AI-based solutions which can also factor in the way pri uh, privacy is seen the world over? Or is privacy seen as uh, as a, something which restricts the abilities for people to build solutions which can lead to layer larger public good. What would you like to say, Kohei, on this uh, aspect? Uh, sure, there is a very complicated and very hard to say the one was. Uh, in terms of the privacy technology, it's just uh, kind of the Google is developing uh, some technology such as the uh, federated learning or that's uh, very preserve privacy preserving. But actually, those technology is uh, very hard to implement it in the set of things. Uh, from the privacy perspective, I assume that's the uh, focusing on the customers at the beginnings. Uh, I'm uh, involved with uh, some of the open source communities, such as the ICHOPUI, uh, where we have been talking about the well-being of something uh, through the impact of the AI, which is a very primary issue uh, from the privacy perspective as well. Because the, uh, uh, when the company is uh, collecting a personal data, they have to promise with the customer through the uh, privacy policies or privacy consent without any notice. Um, customer will be worried about the data, uh, where this data is being used, what is the purpose, or any repurposing of the data. So this is the breach in the promise. I think uh, those kind of the uh, consistencies and requirements for the AI companies to promise with the users and they also give back uh, good things for them. So this is ultimate the communication in between the service providers and the users. I think uh, this is the one step to uh, protect the privacy and provide the AI services uh, for the specific lesions. The bad cases such as the uh, Clearview AI, which has been uh, uh, abused, the many things in the United States or in Canada, uh, where it's been uh, uh, prohibited, to uh, be running their business because they are providing the, the, their output to the SAR party, such as the police, uh, they have a very strong enforcement in case they make any mistake, in such as a bias to any things. Some people have been uh, arrested, uh, even they are not doing any bad things. So this is the bad impact. I think the privacy then uh, consent is a uh, very important to provide the uh, uh, customer data for the service providing, I guess. Yeah, so informed consent and that to informed consent and aware consent with regard to what one is signing for is uh, very, very critical with regard to privacy issues in that. So with this, we have our uh, fifth panelist uh, also who has joined in. So welcome Shavi, who is the founder of Book Doc in Malaysia to this uh, session and I would uh, like you to introduce yourself and give your perspective in the ways on which uh, AI can enable public good. And before you joined, we were discussing on what are the elements that are required and how data and privacy can go hand in hand while we are building better AI solutions. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, thank you for having me. So to give you a bit of uh, background, so I run a digital healthcare company called BookDoc. So we have about a million users in five countries we operate mainly. Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, Indonesia. So the job is to connect and unite patient and healthcare providers. So 
talking about AI, I mean, it plays a big role. Data is another big thing because this is health record. So we we pride ourselves on following all the rules and regulations every country we operate in. So from the PDPA of Malaysia, Singapore, to GDPR of the, the European standards, we also follow the clients who are on the multinationals. And I think AI is very important today where a lot of mundane routine work can be be used using AI, even radiology laboratory results report, right? Except certain things is if they're abused. So if they're taking people's thing and selling the information to insurance company or doing that to sell certain drugs or to drug companies, I think that is a bad thing where the the company should not act as a bad actor, but as a good actor to safeguard. So it's important that uh, this all this AI technology is very crucial, important. But again, the issue is not the technology, but the trust factor, which the barometer, which is very important. So I think like any other industry, they are very important. But I think help is one of the biggest part where the trust and confidence issue is is at key. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's uh, what you said makes a lot of sense because healthcare is one of the fields in which AI is being used. And uh, the book doc, the solution that you made about mentioned about connecting doctors and patients and all. And there again, the importance of privacy and the importance of ensuring the health records are accessible only to the person to whom it belongs or with his consent to any health service provider. That becomes very, very, very relevant. And so, Arvind, would you like to have any perspective on this aspect? Like, how do you ensure privacy as also build AI based solutions? Well, I think that Kai already brilliantly summed up most of the things that I definitely agree with. I think in the long term that privacy is a hygiene factor because if it's not there, then at some point, looking at a new scary such as Secure View AI, you will get a backlash. And if you get a backlash to the innovation, the ecosystem surrounding it will be less rich and it needs to be rich in order for it to thrive in the long run. So it's my view that what is a rich ecosystem? So it's my view that it's a combination of academics. So you need to know if it's technically feasible. Um, it's a combination of regulators. So you need to find a common denominator um, of the rules where everyone in the ecosystem wants to play by. Uh, you need your think tanks to ask the long and the hard and cynical sometimes questions. Um, but you would also need the industry to make sure that it's feasible from... Pro- uh, from a profitable perspective. And all of that needs to feed into politics who are often uh, generalists. Uh, and with that, I actually want to react to what Sebastian said earlier, that what we can do to use it as a, an actual force for good. And I actually think that governance committees on the private company side are underutilized because right now they're most often very much focused on okay, how do we keep AI ethical? Which is a good premise in and of itself. But I think a question that is not being asked or at the very least not being asked enough is okay, as a governance committee, do we have a responsibility to use AI as a force for good? So do we have a responsibility to open source part of our technology or part of our findings? Or is there another area or another application that's maybe not directly um, competitive to our own offering, where the technology could be deployed. So that there is a lot more learning and a lot more sharing going on around the good side, uh, which is currently, in my view, almost non-existent. Yeah. In fact, uh very very interesting perspectives being thrown up and uh, another dimension that i was reading about somewhere was the amount of uh, with the growing use of digital technologies the amount of data that we are generating today and the amount of data driven decision making and the amount of impact it does like uh, especially with the tech companies the kind of uh, social media companies and all which have a lot of data about us and they are able to predict our behaviors or to guide us in thinking about a particular way so how can we use, uh, how do we do, how do we regulate that or how do, or, uh, or does it actually lead to something good or is it right uh, that a few tech companies sit on a lot of amount of data and a few individuals have that authority to take decisions with regard to your life, the way you think, the way you behave. 
So how, what would be your perspective as a chief data scientist on that uh, issue, Sebastian? Well, I, I think, uh, of course, it's not right that uh, only very few people have access to uh, a lot of data, especially in that depth or breadth yeah, that we don't even know that is being collected. But um, I mean, not so. So I think this discussion about privacy is, of course, highly relevant. Um, but there's an additional aspect to keep in mind in that, I mean, not all data we are collecting is personal data. Not all data we are using is, is related to people. I think this is a very relevant discussion and we need to be mindful of it. Um, at the same time, of course, using artificial intelligence and data is not restricted to, to that kind of information. I mean, there's a lot of things that can be done, you know, uh, where we're talking about machines, about sensors, about, I don't know, making a computation center more efficient, you know, using less energy, using less resources, um, where we, you know, the, the machines probably don't really care too much about their privacy. Um, but I think one of these things that machine generated data and people generated data, which is what we're talking about, you know, with all these devices we're carrying around and our online behavior being tracked is, um, it came to mind uh, also also what Aaron said is is we need to be conscious about the use of data. So basically saying, um, okay, we are using this data. Of course, we should ask ourselves, is it ethical? Is it ethical in the long run? What are the consequences and what are the unintended consequences of doing that? And we need to do that very systematically. And um, there, I think it, it even goes goes beyond the aspect of privacy. It's also about asking yourself, well, if if we're using a certain data set and certain algorithms, are we actually achieving what we set out to do? And if we are, are there some side effects we haven't considered beforehand um, that that we need to look out for? So I think this this conscious use of data, not just saying, look, this is a cool technology here, we can quickly just set something up. Um, I mean, this is how some of these large tech companies, I think, started. Yes, and and it was it was very useful. Yeah, so if if they had been let's say, uh, you know, thinking through every step 10 times, we wouldn't be where we are today with all of these, frankly, quite useful tools that we have. But now is the time to bring in more uh, consciousness and care into, the, into this whole thing, of course, because now we are seeing that this speed, which was certainly an advantage in the beginning, now sort of bites us back. Yeah? And, um, and we need to now figure out how can we make this long term and sustainable and lift it to that next level. Yeah. So, anybody would like to respond to what uh, Jay or uh, Chevy to what Sebastian just said? Well, I mean, I, I have been thinking a little bit, Abhishek, about various things that everyone's been saying. You know, ever since you brought up the question about, you know, you know, uh, do all these, you know, privacy considerations become an impediment uh, to innovation? Right. I mean, um, and I, I just think that. That actually, uh, it's, it, that's less of a techno-economic question, right? And in, at least in a democracy, you know, which I, I've been fortunate enough at least all my life to live in democratic countries. And I suppose if you limit yourself to that that part of the world, then then uh, it's it becomes more of a political question, more of a legal question, more of a question of how the judicial system interprets those laws and you know stuff like that. Really, uh, more than it, it is really about technology. And I just, you know, just today, by, by, by some sheer uh, coincidence, I was reading this fascinating article about uh, something called a new phenomena in the U.S. called sedition hunters after the events of, uh, you know, Trump and January and whatnot. Apparently, uh, uh, you know, we, we normally think about all the creepy aspects of privacy invasion uh, you know, either in terms of, OK, something nasty from a central government like China or a massive corporation like Google or whatever. But but we don't ever imagine that this could be something even from the bottom up. And this is a great example of these sedition hunters. Apparently, they've done a lot of good. Uh, apparently, they've helped the FBI. Um, this is just random people, you know, uh, uh, who have looked at those all those pictures and they've been able to find and isolate certain specific uh, individuals who were apparently genuinely involved in those activities. And there's been hundreds of arrests by the FBI on that basis. Uh, but also in one case, there was an innocent um, fireman in Chicago or something uh, who just happened to look very, very similar to one of those people. 
And the big question around all of this was that in many cases initially, because these were people who weren't used to being every informants or something, right? So in their enthusiasm, some of them landed up actually um, publishing uh, publicly uh, their findings saying, oh, look, I've nailed this person and this is who it is. And, and they, 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 their, their identity was just put up right there on the on, on social media. And that became an interesting question. You know, first of all, this is interesting, isn't it? So this is coming bottom up. Some 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 innocent person's identity may have been exposed. You know, they and their family could be exposed to some kind of danger. It's not even some kind of sinister top down affair. It's just literally happening spontaneously. Uh, and, and that raises questions about how, you know, and, and, and so, so, you know, like, for example, from the perspective of the FBI, I think it was that, hey, we've been doing this for a long time, folks. But uh, can we please do this privately? Like instead of, you know, you just publicly uh, putting up that information on social media, for example. So that I thought was a really interesting, um, different take on on all of this stuff. You know. Yeah, yeah exactly. So so again, the same question comes in, like, how do you balance uh, between what technology can do and what technology should not do? And uh, again, I will come to Chevy with regard to his solution and there again, the issue of privacy, especially with regard to health records and electronic health records, when you do a, when you have a solution like BookTok, wherein you can connect with doctors remotely and uh, book appointments and then share data with regard to your healthcare. How do you ensure that your privacy is ensured? As also, you, I'm sure you must be having a consent framework where, with which uh, your health records can be shared to some other health service provider for better advice at a higher level. So, any perspectives on that, Shivi? Yeah. So uh, basically, whatever we have. Is all cap. We follow our honesty and see, right? Whatever, and uh, user consent, whatever information we send. So, doesn't mean that the data. If I'm the son, my father's data, I can have access. My father have to consent to share my data to the son in order for me to have access. Number one. Number two, doctor to doctor access as well. So you go to a GP. The GP may refer you to a specialist, but before referring to a specialist, I could. I cannot just simply give the data. The user, end user, the patient must first consent to say, okay, GP can share the data with my specialist, which I want to consult. Then to have a better uh, patient record, then just doesn't matter. We just open up whatever we, we should do, right? So I think that is very important. Where all again, the health data is, it's like a gold mine, literally. Uh, everything you can do so much with with that from credit risk scoring, uh, from repayment to medical record. So this is a very dangerous zone at the same time because some people get in the wrong hands and it possess a lot of dangers, right? Okay. So any any experiences you have had with regard to this? Any risks or any? So we, we have certain things where we anonymize a lot of data too. So everything if we provide when we work with any organization is always a lot of masking, all this internet penetration, internet cybersecurity. We work with the military forces as also we monitor all the data of the military forces. So same thing here. We mask so meaning we get the name and the identification, but we mask it using a different algorithm altogether or ID. So they still get the data, but it's anonymized. Yeah. Okay. Erwin, your thoughts on that? How do you how do you use healthcare data in a responsible manner? Well, I must say first and foremost that healthcare is not necessarily my area of expertise, but I did look into the COVID tracing apps um, that were uh, basically top of the town in the early days of the pandemic and what the potential consequences of that could be long-term. And um, I think what we saw that when, excuse the language, shit hit the fan, the governments were very keen to kind of extend their remit uh, to, to gather more data about the people just to put a stop to the outbreak. And that launched all kinds of really, really interesting privacy discussions. What that also highlighted was that on a governmental level, um, deep tech procurement wasn't necessarily their uh, immediate area of expertise, at least in healthcare. There have been a lot of uh, data leaks, uh, the Netherlands and Moscow. Um, there have been various initiatives where they let startups compete and try out uh, various versions of, of these COVID apps, um, which were then 
attacked or proved by ethical ha hackers and they completely fell hard. There was a lot of backlash against the Google and Apple initiative that even though it was completely technical sound, received pushback because governments were not comfortable with private companies setting that agenda and making those trade-offs on a privacy level. So I think healthcare is one of those areas where there is still, there are a lot of contested and conflicted views on what the real way is to, to proceed. Um, but I do think, especially because the pandemic brought that to the forefront, that it will be one of the areas that we have to solve quickest uh, in order for artificial intelligence to do a lot of good in that specific area. Because the situation you do not want to end up with is that everyone's healthcare data is on the street. If you look at the negative consequences that are already in place just from a social media environment, um, having that situation with medical data, um, if you, for example, overlay it on the labor force, is definitely something you want to avoid. In fact, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's one of the, the issues that you highlighted, especially regarding contact tracing, was something that we really grappled with. With India was one of the countries which launched the uh, contact tracing app, uh, the Aroke Setu, which had 190 million users on it and uh, it was different from many other countries uh, contact tracing app was that we did bluetooth contact tracing as also the location tracking and, uh, and while designing that one of the core principles was that but it has to be privacy by design like at every level we have to ensure that what kind of uh, protocols will be there to ensure that the data is not used for any purpose other than healthcare and uh, the value that we got was immense i must say because we were able to map the locations where people were were moving around before they got infected because a lot of people remained asymptomatic uh, before uh, even though they were positive and with that we could predict uh, hotspots uh, much before they actually became hotspots so in uh, in many areas we were able to save lives because of that so that again brings us to the classic dilemma of how much privacy and how much uh, public good like where do we draw the line like uh, ultimately the objectives of all governments is to while privacy is a fundamental right and is a basic right that should be assured but at the same time when faced with a pandemic like this uh, does the requirement of saving lives or reducing damage to lives and uh, ensuring healthcare that becomes a better prior, uh, better uh, the more important priority so that's that's we have been grappling with we have been facing criticism court orders and all but then we try to ensure that to be as transparent as possible and to ensure structure so that no one else other than healthcare pro workers have access to that kind of data and that also in an anonymized format yeah kohei would you want to add something to the on that line um, sure in, in terms of the healthcare industry um we haven't uh, defined the uh, privacy regulation this is the very big problems here because uh, under the medical laws um hospitals uh, doctors is uh, using the personal data but this is uh, for the medical purpose it's not for the privacy protections this is, I, I think this is a very similar in other countries as well such as in the us is a hipaa uh, this is also the, for the medical purpose is not the privacy protections i think uh, from the regulatory perspective we have to put the uh, more comprehensive regulation in terms of the privacy uh, to comply with the uh, medical data into design. There are also a lot of uh, hospitals, uh, old uh, medical facility is not providing the sufficient privacy policies. They just align of the medical role is not the privacy role. So this is a turning point to, um, to transfer.